Good morning, Cornerstone. Glad you can join us again this week for our service. My name is Nathan, and I'm just going to start us off with a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together, even from a distance, uh, together as one church, as Cornerstone. I pray that you continue to grow our community and that we can come together this morning and be able to give you the worship and the praise that you deserve, Lord, and that we can hear your word and that we can grow in our faith and our relationship with you. So we lift this time up to you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Cornerstone, this is Pastor Paul, and we're going to enter into a time of praise. And so please join us in giving worship to our God together. You're the God who makes the giants fall. You bring down the walls of Jericho. You're the God who gives a miracle. We believe. You're the God who parts the ocean wide just to bring us closer to your side. You're the God who brings the dead to life. We believe, we believe. And God, how great you are, great things you have done. For everything we've seen, there is more to come. Every victory. Every battle won For everything we've seen There is more to come We are confident in all your ways Cause we know you never make mistakes God, you fill us with a greater faith. We believe. God, how great you are. Great things you have done. For everything we've seen, there is more to come. Every victory. Every battle won For everything we've seen There is more to come And all of our hope in All of our trust in All of our future in The God who never fails All of our faith in all of our strength in all of our future in the God who never fails. All of our hope in all of our trust in all of our future in the God who never fails. All of our faith in all of our strength in all of our future. The God who never fails God, how great you are Great things you have done For everything we've seen There is more to come Every victory Every battle won for everything we've seen, there is more to come. God, how great you are, great things you have done. For everything we've seen, there is more to come. 
every victory, every battle won, for everything we've seen, there is more to come. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence, you never fail me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me Thanks, Paul, for leading us in that time of worship. And let's continue our worship 
with prayer. Lord, we thank you for all that you are doing in our world. Uh, even though we are going through some hard times, um, we know that you are good despite our situation, despite what we're facing. But we do pray for opportunities, Lord, to continue to share your good news to those around us, whether they be family or friends or coworkers or neighbors, Lord. We pray that no matter what our situation, that we remember that you sent your son down uh, to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, and that he was raised up from the dead to bring us life, to conquer sin and death. Uh, I pray that we be able to continue to share that good news no matter where we are and what we're doing, Lord. But we do pray for continued patience in the time of COVID. We pray for work opportunities for those who are out of work or who have lost work. Uh, and we pray that they be able to put their faith in you and be patient, Lord. We are also thankful uh, for our numbers in New Jersey going down, but we also pray for those areas in the country where they're being impacted even more now than ever. And we pray for wisdom for everyone, but we pray especially for those who are on the front lines, Lord, both in our community and out of our community uh, here at Cornerstone. We pray for their ongoing safety and health. We pray for the leadership of our country and uh, of countries around the world, really, um, during these hard times. We pray that we continue to fight against uh, the virus, but also for, uh, for racial justice and equality for all. Uh, we pray for Emily and Carl during their pregnancy. And uh, we also pray for Brian, Karina, and Kayla during their pregnancy, uh, slash potentially their, the birth of their child. I don't know what a lot can happen between when I record this and when it's broadcasted. Uh, but we pray for, uh, again, for Emily and Carl and Brian, Karina and Kayla for their health and uh, their patience, and that they just be able to lean on you. And we thank you again for this time for us to be able to gather together as a church, despite being from a distance. Uh, but we pray that you continue to allow our community to grow, that we can continue to love one another and build it, your body up in your kingdom. So we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Cornerstone. I'm glad to see you all this morning. My name is Justin, and I'll be reading today's scripture reading. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your, de your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. This is the word of the Lord. God's grace to you, Cornerstone. Last Sunday, Paul, Pastor Paul finished the series on Hebrews, the New Testament letter that we had been going through. And finished in chapter 13, so we're done with that. And then next Sunday, we will start a new sermon series on the Old Testament book, Ecclesiastes. We won't go through every chapter like we did through Hebrews, but we will have a sermon series through the, hitting on some key points in that Old Testament book. Today's message is kind of a standalone message, uh, and it deals with the true acts of worship. Uh, for often, we limit, as followers of Jesus, our concept of worship to just our gatherings on Sundays or 
in, you know, in today's environment are tuning in to our worship on Sundays or going to or participating in a Sunday class or a life group. Um, and we limit that that's when we really are worshiping God or even just to our short times of devotions with the Lord. Um, but here in our text, this is not the, how God limits our uh, worship or his concept of worship uh, as he desires us to worship him especially as described here in our text of Isaiah 58, 6 through 12. I grew up mainly being a part of a Baptist church uh, community, but I, I remember before we, uh, my family became a part of that Baptist church, uh, my family had spent some time um, participating in a congregational church community, and then after that, a Methodist church community. Um, and when I was in eighth grade, then my family found and became a part of the Baptist church community. And I remained a part of that community uh, until I left Massachusetts to go to Denver Seminary as a young adult at the age of 24. Now, I share this because our church gatherings, um, and those three that I mentioned, the Congregational, the Methodist, and the Baptist, uh, were quite different from the church gathering of my good friend in uh, middle school, high school, um, the church he attended. And one time, I know this because one time he invited me to go uh, join his gathering on uh, Sunday. And so I did. I, I accepted his invitation and I went with him. And I remember uh, how different it was because it still sticks in my mind today. Um, I remember how uncomfortable I felt when I was participating with his family and, and everybody else there. It was like everyone knew what to do and when to do it, uh, and nobody explained anything and didn't give me a heads up before it happened. So I just kind of had to go along as best I could. And there were readings from a, a prayer book that everybody would read out loud together. Uh, there were times when we were supposed to stand and kneel and sit. And so I just went along as best I could for those. And then there were things after which the priest would say something and then everybody would respond together in unison out of memory. And so I just remained silent at those times because that's just... Uh, I didn't know what to say and when to say it. And I got the feeling that, or I was observed that worship was very organized, and, but it lacked an enthusiasm um, in which, in, like the, at the level that I was accustomed to in my uh, church community gatherings. And it was like people were almost just going through the motions uh, without expressing much emotion. And a, a heartfelt engagement in the things that we were all doing together uh, during that, that worship gathering was missing, it seemed. And this memory came back to me as I was studying this chapter 58 of Isaiah in preparation for today, which deals with what God considers true worship. I'll, I'll qualify it as that. The, the prophet Isaiah who wrote this uh, book uh, his ministry spanned from about 740 to 700 BC. And during this period, uh, the nation or the nations of Israel were, we could say Israel, the people of Israel were divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. And the northern kingdom called Israel in 722 was destroyed by the Assyrians. And, and it was God's judgment on them because of their continual idolatry. So before today's text in Isaiah chapter 58, the first five verses where we start in verse 6, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah to the southern kingdom of Judah. And they were also false in their worship, but in a different way than the northern kingdom was, though they did practice idolatry, but many of the southern kingdom still 
went to the temple of God and, and quote, worshipped the, the Lord God. And so, but they were, they were false worship, we see, and they went through the motions, We've, we learn from these verses, but without any heartfelt love for the Lord God. It's like they were doing these things, hoping to obligate the Lord then to do something for them, what they wanted. And listen to how the people of Judah questioned God in verse, the beginning of verse 3. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? You see, it was because... Their worship displeased God. The worship of the people of Judah was displeasing to God because instead of praying for God's will to be done, they were praying that God would do their will. And their worship was displeasing because they were making demands of God and failing in the same time to submit to His will. They were thinking that if they fasted, that that would obligate God to do what they wanted. Um, they wanted their will to be done instead of waiting for His will to be done. And we need to think and con- consider ourselves is if our worship is displeasing to God for similar reasons, that we want God to do what we want instead of waiting for His will to be done. We need to ensure We are making prayer requests instead of prayer demands. You know, God, you got to do this. Uh, This is like a creature telling the Creator, um, I will obey you if you do this. There's like an agreement there. True worship, you see, is coming to God with a humble spirit, recognizing who we are in light of who God is the Creator, all-powerful Redeemer and Savior. As missionary and theologian E. Stanley Jones wrote, I quote, Prayer is surrender to God in cooperation with that will. Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to the will of God. Isaiah chapter 58 speaks about fasting. It's all in this context. And fasting is an act of worship. Fasting is simply denying ourselves, in the most cases, of food, sustenance, for a certain period of time. So out of our desire to meditate and commune with the Lord God, it, it, it is meant to help us focus, as well as give up and deny ourselves as an act of worship. So our text is the Lord's description in verses 6 through 12 of the kind of fasting that God desires. Or we could say it's the kind of worship God desires. Listen again to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it Not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? The fasting, or we could say the worship, God chooses is, in summary, stopping oppression and assisting the poor. When we worship God through these actions, we bring glory to God. We bring glory to God, as verse 8 says and describes, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And a similar meaning we find in 1 Peter 2, verse 12, which says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. When our actions point to Jesus, they glorify the Lord God and they are true acts of worship. This is worship. Now, true acts of worship, then we see here, are defined not only specifically, but in in this case, 
is stopping oppression and assisting the poor. And in doing this out of our love for God, then we bring glory to God. And we bring glory to God through these actions because God's character is being displayed for the world to see by our actions. Because God is just and God is compassionate. And Jesus sacrificed his own life to save others. Standing up against oppression is dangerous in certain contexts. But Jesus modeled the ultimate sacrifice to break the oppression of sin in our lives. We worship the Lord when we stand up for a group or a person who is demeaned or treated as inferior because they are valuable to God. Their life has value to God and so therefore value to us. True acts of worship flowing from our faith in the Lord Jesus are stopping oppression and assisting the poor. Now, oppression and poverty are often intertwined together. Long-term economic oppression of people exists only with systemic support in a society. For example, decades before the prophet Isaiah, who wrote the text that we're studying today, there was another prophet, Amos, who spoke out against how Israel was oppressing their poor. And the picture in the book of Amos, one, another Old Testament book by a prophet, is one of significant disparity between the poor and the rich. There's a big divide. Archaeologists have confirmed this picture that Amos paints of this shocking extremes of wealth and poverty during that period of time, which would have flowed into Isaiah's time as well. In early Jewish settlements of the Promised Land, there was equal distribution as Joshua and the Lord, through Joshua, made it happen um, among the families and tribes of Israel, equally distributed all the wealth. And all Israel enjoyed this, a similar standard of living. There wasn't this great disparity. Um, and this was still true from what we can see in the 900s BC, in that century, or that millennium. No, that century, yeah, right. But around 760 BC, in the time of Amos, and just a little bit before Isaiah, archaeologists discovered there were bigger, better built homes in one area, and then poor houses all crowded together closely in another area. And the poor in Amos's day no longer owned their own land, but were like tenant farmers of the landowners who took their payments in amounts of wheat that was far beyond what was reasonable. So in a sense, extravagant rent just to gain more for themselves. From Amos, we see that often poverty is not the result of laziness, but because of unjust distribution of wealth to a very few. John Perkins, an African-American and native of Mississippi, tells how he came to understand this system or the system of inequality in the United States. In the 1940s, when he was about 11 years old, well, he was 11 years old, he was away from home and was visiting relatives. So he decided to make some money in order to buy a gift for his family, you know, when he went home. So he hired himself out to a white farmer as a day laborer. And at the end of the 12-hour day, he was handed his pay, 15 cents for 12 hours. Now, the farmer owned the plow, he owned the land and all the means of production, and all John had to offer was his labor. He also knew that the last black man to talk back was, had been chained to the back of a car and then dragged through the town that was nearby on a Saturday afternoon. You see, with no consequences for any of these kinds of acts, low pay or this kind of violence against someone who's just questioning the low pay, 
That means that society supports this systemic economic oppression of the black community. Exploitation and oppression are often the reasons that exist behind poverty. Now, we have enough food to feed the planet, and it's well known. But then why do so many parts of the world still go in hunger? Well, often it's because of systemic issues in the world that prevent the distribution of the food. It could be governmental, it could be economic, those things. Here are some statistics of the United States. The poverty level for an individual in an is in 2020, an annual income for an individual of $17,760. I mean, not 17, sorry, $12,760. And there's 38.1 million people in the United States that are at or below the poverty level. 41% of those, 38.1 million, are white, 28% Hispanic, 23% black, and 10 or 5% Asian. But the more telling statistic here uh, that helps us understand what this really or what is really happening among our different groups, ethnicities in the United States, is the rate of poverty of each ethnic group. And now the poverty rate or the rate of poverty is the percentage of people within that ethnic group that live below the poverty level, you know, the $12,760. And here it is. Native Americans are the highest at 25%. That's one out of every four Native Americans live in poverty. Blacks are the second at 21%, one out of five. Hispanics are 18%, Asians are 10%, and whites are 8%. Now these poverty rates point to a more systemic issue of ongoing economic oppression of minority groups in the United States. Historically, the United States, if we think about it uh, and remember, the United States devastated Native American communities and took their land and forcibly relocated them to other places in the country. And we still see the lasting effects of this now in these, stati in these statistics today. Historically, if we think of the black community, blacks were enslaved and treated as property and even bred and mistreated and abused and sold. Um, and this existed in the colonies uh, originally, as well then even into the, when we became the United States. And the total amount of time this existed here in this country was about 200 years or a little more. 200 years we allowed slavery to continue and thrive. We still see the lasting effects of this in our society today. This points to systemic issues. So systemic oppression still exists here in our country, and we see other cases of this too. As followers of Jesus, we are not to respond to oppression of any group or person with silence and passivity. That is not an option, should not be an option for us as followers of Jesus. As Jamar Tisby stated in his documentary, and, uh, which was based on his book, and both of them were titled by the same name, Color, The Color of Compromise. I quote, this is what he said, the refusal to act in the midst of injustice is itself an act of injustice. Indifference to oppression perpetuates oppression, end quote. The Lord said in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? And a yoke is a wood, wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals and attached to a plow, a cart, uh, to which they were, they're going to pull. And this is a metaphor for oppression. Jesus used this metaphor of the yoke when he said in Matthew, 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus frees us from the oppression of sin. When we follow him as Lord, when we place our faith and trust in him as Lord, he frees us. So real freedom from oppression is only possible in, by faith in Christ Jesus as Lord. So therefore, true acts of worship of the Lord Jesus are stopping oppression and assisting the poor in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Here's an example from history. In his book titled The Rise of Christianity, Rodney Stark studied how Christianity grew so rapidly in just a few hundred years following the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. One observation was how Christians reacted to epidemics that were reported in certain cities at in the period of time. And people in large numbers were getting sick and dying. And much of the population fled the cities, fleeing for their lives, often leaving sick family members behind. And guess who stayed behind to care for the sick and the dying? Christians. Christians stayed and cared for the, the sick and the dying, sacrificing their own lives to do so in many cases. But in the end, many people survived due to the care and the nurturing of the Christian community that stayed in the cities. And the people who survived were very grateful and moved by the care and the love that they had received. And, and even the city officials uh, acknowledged and took note of the actions of these Christians. And when the epidemics ended, the survivors naturally shared with others what had been done for them and why. And the gospel of Jesus spread. The last few years in the United States, we have repeatedly witnessed unarmed black men being killed by white police officers. And, or in the case of Ahmad Arbery, uh, being killed by two white men who were not police officers. Not only have these videos of this violence done on these black men become public, but also the lack of justice for these deaths has become more and more public. In the case of Ahmad Arbery, no charges were brought against the two men involved here in his death uh, for months following his killing. And it was only when the video of the shooting became public and the public outcry for justice grew that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation stepped in and took a look at the investigation. And then the two men were charged with murder and aggravated assault in the killing of Mr. Arbery. As followers of Jesus, black lives matter because God values them. We worship Jesus as Lord by standing with the black community and joining the outcry for justice to be carried out. We can support and walk alongside those who protest injustice because God loves justice and righteousness. True acts of worship minister to the spiritual side of people and the physical parts of people, their bodies and their needs as well. And then also spiritual acts of true worship is because we also fight for justice and stand up for justice and equality in the larger society. And this means a humble um, and submissive approach to God and a bold and aggressive and loving appeal to the greater society and the world on behalf of the oppressed and the poor. 
there's an example from history of this. John Newton. John Newton lived from 1725 to 1807. And as a young man, he was forced into uh, to be service as a sailor in, the Eng in England's Royal Navy for a period of time. And after he finished that service, uh, he ended up working on slave ships and, and who were uh, involved in the slave trade for years. Uh, he became a Christian during his work on slave ships. And he served as first mate on one slave ship and then uh, as captain on three more following that. But John did not realize the contradiction between his faith and his work. It's for some reason it was this disconnect in his heart. Eventually he retired from the slave trade, but then later in his life, John Newton became very regretful for his part in the in participation in the slave trade. Uh, so later, uh, in 1787, Newton then be, uh, was so regretful, he wrote a track, uh, an article, we could say, titled Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. And in this article, he graphically described the horrors of the slave trade and his personal role in it. And he influenced many people, including William Wilberforce, who would spend the rest of his life working toward the abolition of slavery. Now, labor, later, Wilberforce uh, challenged Newton to speak publicly against slavery. And so Newton accepted the challenge, and he became a major voice in the uh, work for the abolition of slavery, which did happen in England on August 1st, 1834, which is 31 years before slavery was abolished in the United States, 31 years before. John Newton is also uh, famous for being the author of a very familiar hymn, Amazing Grace. He wrote that hymn. We know of John Newton because he is a rare example of someone who participated in the oppression of a group of people and then through the transformation of Christ in his heart and life, then became an advocate against the oppression of what he participated in before. And this is an example of the worship God desires. When we worship God by stopping oppression and assisting the poor, Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you will you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail when we live a life of true acts of worship jesus guides us jesus satisfies us he strengthens us no matter what the circumstances are in our life he is our rock and our redeemer Living life by taking no risks to help others, especially in this now pandemic, is not, does not display the character of God. It is, it is not worshiping God if we're, all we're worried about is ourselves and our own safety. Taking a risk, even at the risk of getting sick or even for our own life, to stop oppression and assist the poor, um, this brings the glory to God. And, and when we do this in the name of Jesus, it points others to Him as well. Just like the early Christians did in the epidemics in the cities in the Roman Empire. This is the kind of worship that God desires. Has someone come into your mind through this? Someone for which you can care for and show love and compassion during this pandemic? then take action on doing something to help them, care for them, reach out to them. Also think of how you can stand up to stop oppression and assist the poor in our society around us, in our communities, or in our country, or in the world. 
especially at this time during the pandemic, but at any time. And we do this out of our worship of the Lord Jesus. How can you stand up against oppression and help assist the poor out of your love for Jesus at this time? Let's pray together. Father, we know that you look at our hearts. And this is where true worship is generated. It's our humble submission to you as Lord and God, creator and sustainer of life, redeemer and savior of our souls through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Lord, this is, this is our humble submission to you, and we pray that you would be Lord of our lives and that that would be evident to the people in our lives and evident to those who may not even know us yet by our actions and the things we stand up for and the things we speak out against. Lord, we pray that we would not be silent in the midst of injustice because that in itself is an injustice. If we see people being mistreated when we are there unjustly, then we must speak out or do something, even at the risk of our own safety. Lord, may you enable us to do these acts of worship because we know we cannot do it without you being in our hearts and enabling us to do so. Lord, glorify yourself through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Cornerstone, we'll see you next week. God bless. As we respond in song, let us look to God, our God of justice, and seek to do justice in this world because that is God's desire for us and for the world around us. So let's sing this song together. of justice Savior to all came to rescue the weak and the poor chose to serve and not be served Jesus you have called us freely we receive Freely we will give, we must go Live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken We must go, stepping forward Keep us from just singing, move us into action We must go To act justly every day Loving mercy in every way Walking humbly before you, God You have shown us what you require Freely we receive now, freely we will give. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into action. We must go Fill us up, send us out Fill us up, send us out Fill us up, send us out, Lord Fill us up, send us out Fill us up, and send us out Fill us up, and send us out, Lord 
fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up, send us out, Lord. We must go. Live to feed the hungry. Stand beside the broken. We must go. Stepping forward. Keep us from just singing. Move us into action. We must go. We must go. Live to feed the hungry. Stand beside the broken. We must go. Stepping forward. Keep us from just singing. Move us into action. We must go. Hi, Cornerstone. Today I'll be sharing a part of my testimony and focus on what it was like for me to grow up in a Christian household and how that has shaped my walk in Christ. And before I go into details, I'd like to give a little introduction about myself. So I'm Nina. Um, I recently joined Cornerstone last fall and a few weeks ago I became a member. I'm really glad to have met so many wonderful people here and I just feel very welcome in this community. And when Jeff asked me to share this Sunday, I was hesitant to share at first just because I didn't know where to even begin. Um, but after making a few drafts of my story, I thought I'd just start from my childhood and go from there. So just ever since I can remember, I've gone to church on Sundays, um, like Bible studies on Fridays and you know, memorize many Bible verses, stories, just like a lot of um, like any other kids that's grown up in church. And when I was 13, I decided to get baptized with the rest of my class. And at that time, I didn't know what it really meant to follow Christ, but I felt like it was the right step to show that that was a direction that I wanted to continue in. And after getting baptized, I had plans to be more involved in my church and maybe take on a greater role in the children's ministry. But I lost my faith to continue doing that just because of my home life. Um, so my dad is like your typical strict Asian parent. Um, let's say if I got a B on a math test, I would probably get scolded for an hour, like put in timeout. And um, I was pretty used to that, even though it did put a strain on my mental health. But um, when I started high school, I began to feel like actually scared to be at home. So during that time, my dad had a lot of pressure and stress from work. And so whenever he'd come home, he would be pretty short tempered. And it seemed like if anything was out of place, it would aggravate him. And um, he would take out a lot of his frustrations on my mom and there were only the three of us at home but most nights or mornings uh, my dad would be yelling at my mom from downstairs and I would just be in my room kind of hiding out in there um, listening to music to drown out this noise um, all of the yelling and just trying to um, still be like a normal child like studying uh, maybe calling my friends and a few times when I did get the courage to go downstairs, I would um, find my mom collapsed on the floor crying because she was just so tired of everything that was going on. And um, she would beg my dad to tell her what she needed to do to make him less angry. And in those situations, I was genuinely scared to help my mom up or just to tell my dad to calm down because um, I would just see the anger on his face and it was um, like I was really scared that I would get hit or um, he would get even more angry and possibly get someone else hurt and when I did raise my voice to tell my dad that there are 
more productive ways to express his feelings of like stress, frustrations. Um, but, and then when I didn't raise my voice, I just felt a huge pressure weighing down on me just because I really hate being pushed to the point where I feel like I have to raise my voice in order to be heard. And honestly, a lot of the details of those arguments, situations are a bit murky for me just because it was easier for me to block out those ne negative experiences just to help me cope with the emotional trauma. Um, and at that time, I was really afraid to tell anyone about my situation, like not even my close friends, and definitely not anyone from my church because my dad had a good reputation there. Um, and I also thought about reporting the issue to like a school counselor, but I just didn't want to risk my parents separating. I felt like that could really um, break my family. And because I was keeping a lot of these issues to myself, I distanced myself from a lot of my friends. And oftentimes when I walked through school, um, I'd end up not talking to anyone at all. And I generally didn't remember how I got through the day. And um, just overall, it was a pretty dark time for me in high school. And I also stopped consistently going to church because everything that I had learned about forgiveness, love, marriage, um, being humble just wasn't reflected in my family. And during that time, like my mom and I would pray for my dad to, um, just for him to have healing and for him to just kind of be less stressed out at work. And a verse that we, um, that I remembered saying was from John 16, verse 13. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And these words comforted me because I was helpless to do anything in that situation. It wasn't a good time for me to confront my dad and tell him that like his actions were wrong and actually very hurtful and um just after that i decided to go to a college that was honestly the furthest away from new jersey so that i could leave a lot of my family history behind and make new friends and start over um but just i still had this experience on the back of my mind and as like school became more difficult um when I was feeling the pressure of like, what do I do with my life? I confided in one of my closest friends about my childhood experiences and he encouraged me to go to therapy to discuss my thoughts and also try to open up a conversation with my dad about how I felt. And so over Thanksgiving, I believe it was in 2017, I was driving to my relative's place with my dad and on that car ride, it just felt like the right moment to tell him how I felt about my childhood and ask him why he took out his stress and frustrations on my mom and I. And the peace and calm that I felt during the entire confrontation with my dad could have only been because God was by my side and opening up my heart to listen and understand what my dad was going through. It really isn't easy for me to forgive someone that hasn't shown that same kindness for me first. Um, but there's this verse, Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. And this verse reminds me to lead with empathy and forgiveness, just because it really is the least that I can do in comparison to how much God has given me. And um, honestly, now I feel a lot closer to my family. I'm really glad that I moved back from Georgia after being away for school for so long. And it just feels really good to have the weight off of my shoulders um, after I forgave um, any negative experiences that I've had in the past. So I'm, yeah, I'm really glad that like, like I know that God always has a plan for me even if I'm going through tough times. So I really hope that my testimony was encouraging for a lot of you guys and I hope everyone has a good rest of their Sunday. 
Hey guys, my name is Daniel and I'll be doing the announcements for this week. Our verse of the month is from Colossians 1, 10 to 11, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Please read this aloud with me. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Gabriel Young will now share a special opportunity coming up next month. Good afternoon, Cornerstone. I'm going to give you an opportunity for sifting in North Jersey. Now, what is sifting, you might ask? And why are we going to North Jersey? Well, Clifton and Patterson is this area with a lot, a lot of uh, Muslims living there. And Global Gates is an organization that we've worked with in the past that target gateway cities, places that have access to unreached people groups. There are tens of thousands of Turkish folk here, maybe like 50, 70,000, and maybe a little less Palestinians, Lebanese, or Jordanians. The Sarah Hoya has some experience in East Asia doing missions, as well as planning a church in Brooklyn, Chinatown, and she was in, starting to work on this area. Here's a picture from last fall. She was there, and what she does is she talks to people in the park. She sits for the people of peace, people that are interested. And you can come Saturdays anytime um, from 3 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. We'll first worship for three songs. We'll have a prayer walk. We'll do a brief role play to train you. And we'll pass out face masks <clears throat> as like a gift and then also gospel pamphlets and engaging conversations. And whoever's interested, we'll record their phone numbers and link them up with Sarah Hoy so she can focus on people of peace. First give them ESL classes and then maybe Bible studies. Um, Anthony and Polly went last time, there I am. So people have coming from different churches in North Jersey. Any, anybody can come. Even uh, if you're disabled, you can still come. So this is uh, back when pre-COVID or uh, ESL class. Make some nice art and crafts. And uh, even one of some outings together. And you can even do uh, visitations with her if you want in the future. Turkish food tastes really good, I'll tell you. Funny story, I know that guy. I had a lot of conversations with people named Mohammed. There was one uh, college kid who went to Colorado. He, he realized his dad brainwashed him. He's trying to undo that. But he doesn't really want to receive Christ. Uh, Patterson local I met, he said people will get killed in Patterson when he was growing up, a lot of gangs, or uh, a lot of violence, but doesn't see Christ as a way yet. I uh, met a guy who was almost reportedly accepted Jesus uh, a week or two ago. I wasn't able to understand everything he said because it's English. And I also met a kid uh, from Egypt. I shared a bunch of Bible stories with him last Saturday. I had an opportunity to give him an Arabic Bible. And his three friends just kind of sat there on a bench listening for a good 10, 15 minutes. So I see like I've been able to plant a lot of seeds and not see uh, a lot of people peace yet. But that's what fishing is, right, guys? We have to sift. And she says we're going to be fishers of men. So I hope you guys can, can come. Ask me any questions if you want. Our missionary of the week is Vivian Ma, who is serving with COCM in the UK. She is ministering to the British-born Chinese and raising them up to be leaders in the church. Pray for her to have many opportunities to make disciples of Jesus. This is the time period for deacon nominations for 2021. Please take the time to nominate someone from our congregation to become a deacon. The nomination period ends August 2nd. The committee member for the English congregation is Mike Yu. You can email him with your nominations at the email listed on your screen. We'll be having a virtual VBS from August 13th to 15th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Please consider volunteering to help. You can register children and sign up to volunteer on our website. Next Sunday is the first week of the month, which means we'll be partaking in communion together. Please prayerfully prepare the elements to partake in communion together. Do you need prayer? Share your prayer requests through our website and our leadership will pray for them. Click on the image on our website to leave your request. Hang out after worship. 
At 1 p.m., you can go to our website and a link will be provided. So you can hang out together with us, catch up, we can encourage each other, eat lunch, and be the body of Christ. Now I will close us in prayer. Hey God, I want to thank you for this week that you've given us and for all the, all the blessings that you've given us, uh, both that we see and we don't see. Um, I want to pray that you can reveal to us opportunities that we can minister to our neighbors, uh, even during this time where most of us are stuck inside. Um, God, I pray that you can be with us and I pray that you can use us to be uh, your workers. Um, and I pray that all that we do can be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us, guys. Hope to see you next week. Let justice and